Hey guys, today I'll show you a mystery horror TV series named 1899 Season 1. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama takes place in June of 1899, when an immigrant ship named the Prometheus, carrying more than 1,400 passengers, traveled to the new continent but mysteriously disappeared on the vast ocean. Despite the relentless searching from the government, there was still no trace of it. Mora, whose brother was one of the passengers on the Prometheus, one day received a letter from him asking her to meet him in New York. Determined to investigate and uncover the truth, Mora, who was based in England, boarded a ship bound for New York. Coincidentally, this ship was run by the same company as the missing Prometheus and was of similar size and specifications, which couldn't help but cause a little worry among the passengers, praying they wouldn't encounter the same fate. On the third day of the ship's voyage, the captain received a strange telegram, repeatedly sending a set of coordinates. When measured on a map, the location was roughly a seven-hour journey away. The captain speculated it could potentially be from the missing Prometheus, as only a few ships on this route were capable of sending such long-distance telegrams. So he immediately ordered a change in course to investigate the coordinates. Though the deputy named Ramiro and crew were somewhat reluctant, they ultimately carried out the captain's orders. The captain then returned to his office alone, looking desolate as he gazed at a photo of a family of five. Clearly, he had a story of his own. Suddenly, there was a knock at the door. It was Mora, who had inadvertently heard about the telegram while on deck. Upon learning that it might be from the Prometheus, she became excited and wanted to learn more. However, the captain did not reveal much, saying he would announce the news to all passengers. Before long, the captain came to the grand dining hall where all passengers had gathered. When he announced his intention to deviate from the course to investigate the missing ship, most passengers opposed, not wanting to delay their journey because of an unverified telegram. But the captain was determined to change the route. He was just informing everyone of his decision. On the ship's deck, the captain again encountered Mora, who was contemplating whether there could be any survivors on the Prometheus, which had been adrift for four months. The captain immediately shared his thoughts that while humans have explored every corner of the land, the deep ocean remains a mystery. Suddenly, they heard someone shout. Looking out, the missing Prometheus was adrift not far away. What puzzled everyone was that despite several flares being sent, there was no response, not like there were any survivors. Ramiro thought they should report to the company before making a decision, but the captain seemed oddly fixated on this missing ship and insisted on exploring it first. Mora quickly volunteered that as a doctor, she might be able to help. All the passengers on the ship huddled in the corridors, whispering and watching as the captain rowed a small boat, slowly approaching the Prometheus. Among them, a priest clasped his hands, barely concealing his inner tension. As the ship got closer, it seemed like a monstrous beast ready to swallow people. The captain left two crew members to watch over the boat, then took the lead and climbed up the stairs of the ship. Upon reaching the deck and lighting the lamps, the group was stunned by the sight in front of them. They could have never imagined that this once luxurious liner could decay into such a state in just four months. What's more, they couldn't find the whereabouts of 1,400 and more passengers, not even a single corpse. The captain picked up a headband from the ground, his face filled with disbelief, and stealthily pocketed it. The group subsequently arrived at the pilot house, which was equally disheveled, and the telegraph machine had long been damaged. So how exactly was the previous signal sent? At the same time, Ramiro on another liner received a report from his men that the previously continuous telegraph had abruptly stopped. Clearly, someone on the Prometheus had done this. However, unknown to them, a drenched man appeared on the deck not far away, and possibly he might be a survivor who had swum from the Prometheus. On the Prometheus, the captain and others, still searching for survivors, finally made a new discovery. They spotted a colorful beetle crawling into a cabinet in the corner of the wall. Suddenly, there was a loud bang from the cabinet. The captain quickly drew his gun. Mora turned around and seeing they were all ready, cautiously approached and opened the cabinet door. Everyone was shocked to see a little boy was sitting inside, his gaze dull. When the boy noticed someone approaching him, he didn't show joy or fear, but solemnly handed Mora a triangular stone from his bosom. 
At the same time, the mysterious survivor who had boarded the other liner listened intently, found an empty room, and took out a beetle identical to the one Mora and the others had seen, placing it in the door gap. Not long after, the door automatically opened. The following day, the captain and his party returned early to their own liner. Apart from the little boy, they hadn't found anyone else, not even a corpse. Mora asked a series of questions, but the boy was mute and did not utter a single word. He just handed the triangular stone to Mora again. Mora was so anxious that she was full of questions and not knowing how to voice them. She could only helplessly pat the boy's head, but accidentally noticed a triangular mark on the boy's head. It was only then that he reacted. Suddenly, there was a loud knocking at the door. The captain, looking as if he had gone mad, grabbed the boy and demanded to know what had happened on the ship. Mora swiftly stopped the captain, afraid he would scare the child. She pulled him outside and only then found out that ever since he had left the Prometheus, the captain had been experiencing a series of strange events. He first dreamed of his wife and three daughters setting themselves on fire at home. Upon waking up, he tightly clutched the headband he had picked up on the Prometheus. It turned out that this dream was a reflection of real events, and the headband had actually been used by his eldest daughter. But why and how was it on that ship? Subsequently, Ramiro knocked on the door. He announced that the company had sent a new telegram instructing the captain to sink the Prometheus into the sea. The two then made their way to the control room, discovering all compasses in a state of uncontrollable rotation. Even the compass had ceased to function. Clearly, a profound secret was hidden in the mysterious Prometheus. Now, all passengers were buzzing with speculation, believing the ship to be cursed by the devil. But the captain had more on his mind. A few months prior, the company had sold all its liners to a British company. The current ship, just like the Prometheus, wasn't carrying any cargo, and the cabins weren't even fully occupied. The route was a losing business proposition, but he didn't know why the company would arrange this. A series of doubts left the captain perplexed, and he was resistant to the company's orders. He was not willing to sink the Prometheus. In his cabin, the captain suddenly heard a familiar song coming from outside. He followed the sound and saw a figure flash by. The captain became excited, certain that the song was coming from a room, so he pushed the door open forcefully. The soft singing stopped instantly, and the captain showed a stunned expression. The furnishings in the room were identical to his home. His deceased wife and three daughters were sitting by the fireplace. Seeing their husband and father return, the wife went to prepare dinner as usual, while the eldest daughter came forward to console her father, urging him to spend more time at home and less at sea, because strange apparitions kept appearing at their house. The captain was in tears, holding his daughter tightly and refusing to let go. To his horror, his daughter suddenly caught fire. The captain was blown away by the hot blast of air. When he looked again, the room had turned into a charred mess, and a colorful beetle was on the floor. He followed the beetle into the fireplace, where there was a ladder leading upward. When he climbed up, he found himself back in his office on the liner. The deck was marked with a strange triangular symbol. The entire experience was so real that the captain broke down, believing everything to be influenced by the Prometheus. Unfortunately, the only survivor, the little boy, refused to reveal anything. The captain had no choice but to return to his office, looking at the secret passage he had just crawled out of. He planned to return for another exploration, but this time the surroundings were all sealed with brick. Suddenly, there was a knock at the door. The captain had to abandon his exploration. Upon opening the door, he found it was a crew member reporting on the fuel situation. Only half of the coal remained, barely enough to reach their destination, New York. Before long, the captain once again gathered all the passengers in the banquet hall, announcing a crucial decision. He planned to return, towing the Prometheus back to its point of departure since there wasn't enough coal to take it to a further destination. All the passengers voiced their strong objections, but the captain chose to ignore them. Mora hurriedly followed him to the deck. The captain sighed and explained his decision. He felt there was something wrong with that ship, and the company was trying to cover it up. Moreover, before departure, he had received a mysterious letter containing pictures of his deceased family members and news of the disappearance of the Prometheus. The envelope bore the phrase, What is lost will be found. The captain now understood that perhaps his family's death was related to the ship. The headband of his daughter found on board was the best proof. Therefore, he was determined to bring the Prometheus back for investigation. As night fell, the missing Prometheus, under the guidance of the ropes, finally embarked on its journey home. However, strange things started to happen one after another on the ship. First, it was the telegraph, continuously receiving strange triangular markings, which were very similar to the triangular pyramid brought by the boy. Also, there was a triangular symbol on Mora's necklace pendant. 
At this point, the captain was brought to the deck by the crew because they found a female corpse with wide open eyes in a corner. However, after a thorough examination by the doctor, no wounds or bruises were found on the body, and it was speculated that she died of illness. But Mora felt this was impossible. She had seen the deceased in the economy cabin before, and she seemed lively and healthy, not at all like someone who was sick. The captain felt that this murder case was strange and instructed his crew not to tell the family yet. Suddenly, a few people felt the liner was slowing down. When they went to the deck, they saw a thick white fog rising from the sea. They could only stop sailing. The continuous strange events made the crew start whispering, thinking it was all due to the captain's stubbornness to rescue the Prometheus. Even the captain himself felt something was wrong. So he brought Mora to his office and told her about finding his deceased daughter's headband on the Prometheus. Then he showed her the strange, secret compartment in his office. Mora looked at the familiar triangular mark and finally believed what the captain said. Both believed that all the strange events originated from the Prometheus and decided to go check again. Under the cover of the fog, the ship seemed even more mysterious. After boarding the ship, they first went to the control room and found that the log in the drawer had long been tattered. Then they came to the captain's room and found a secret passage marked with a triangular symbol. The structure inside was identical. The two became more curious. The captain suddenly remembered that these liners were sold to British businessmen a month ago and were upgraded in the dock. The secret compartment must have been added at that time, but he didn't know why they did this. Later, he remembered another thing. The buyer added a steam gauge to the liner, but they hadn't used it yet. He felt this device was used for other purposes. Looking at the high-temperature furnace connected to the gauge, Mora deduced that the missing passengers might have been incinerated in the furnace. To verify this guess, they hurriedly opened the furnace to check the residue, but they didn't find any traces of human cremation. Instead, the captain saw a few pieces of unburnt paper. He picked them up curiously and found that they were the passenger list of the Prometheus, and Mora's name was surprisingly on the list. The captain was stunned by that, and he glanced at Mora suspiciously, then stuffed the list into his pocket as if nothing had happened. Afterward, the pair rowed back to their own liner in their small boat, completely unaware of the rebellion that had occurred on the liner during their absence. It turns out, the passengers in the economy cabin didn't know that the missing girl was already dead. They were just anxious because they hadn't seen her for a while. At this moment, the liner's security chief, Franz, stood before everyone and publicly announced the girl's death, against the captain's previous orders. Everyone was shocked by the revelation, especially after seeing the girl's corpse. Anger began to kindle in their eyes. Passengers at the economy cabins were usually confined to the dark cabin, with the path to the deck and the VIP area blocked by an iron door. Now, someone had died on the deck for no apparent reason, and the seeds of resentment had begun to sprout. This was exactly the effect that Franz wanted. He then quietly left the economy cabin. However, on his way, Franz unexpectedly came across three dead crew members. Like the previous deceased, there were no signs of injury or bruising on their bodies. Franz deduced that it must be the unknown entity on the Prometheus that was responsible. He felt a need to sink the ship to the bottom of the sea as soon as possible. He wanted to conspire with Ramiro against the captain, but Ramiro just turned his head and walked away. Franz had no choice but to return to the economy cabin with his men. He informed everyone about the ongoing deaths and pointed all the blame at the captain. The anger of these lower-class passengers, which had been suppressed because of the girl's death, erupted completely. Franz took advantage of the situation, opened the armory, and distributed weapons to everyone. Just as everyone was gearing up to confront the captain, the coal worker named Oleg looked worried. As one of the crew who the captain valued highly, he had explored the Prometheus with the captain the previous night. Oleg was about to notify the captain, but Franz saw through his intentions. Oleg was quickly subdued by the angry crowd and locked in a dark room. Unexpectedly, there was an old acquaintance in the room, Jerome, who had also accompanied the captain to explore the Prometheus the night before. However, his crew identity was a disguise, and he was actually a stowaway. After Franz saw through his disguise, he beat him up and locked him up. Another person who had been with them yesterday was the priest living in the luxury suite. As soon as he heard from his companion that the passengers in the economy cabin were planning to harm the captain, he rushed to report it. Unfortunately, he was too late and was soon surrounded and subdued by the passengers. As a result, the people who had once explored the Prometheus together reunited in the dark room, and the passengers at the bottom started to cheer for their seizing control of the liner. However, the mysterious man who had sneaked in from the Prometheus pulled out a strange keyboard. 
After his baffling operations, the entire liner suddenly disappeared from the surface of the sea. Although the passengers didn't notice anything abnormal, the sailors in the cockpit found that the wheel had returned to normal. However, the liner had returned to its position on the shipping route three days ago, and the Prometheus, which was linked by iron chains behind, had disappeared. Franz didn't have time to worry about these issues as long as the liner was heading towards its destination. He was rather concerned about the continuous death of the passengers. Later, Franz swung open the door of the dark room where the captain and others were confined. He called for Oleg and Jerome to come out. When they arrived on the deck, they were both startled, their eyes wide with surprise. In just one day, so many people had died on the ship. Franz then ordered them to dump the bodies into the sea. Threatened by guns, they had no choice but to do as told. By this time, the passengers on the ship were already filled with dread. Many guards forcibly escorted passengers back to their rooms to reduce the time spent outside, but even so, people were still mysteriously dying. The armed passengers from the lower deck couldn't stand it anymore. They found Ramiro and demanded an explanation. Backed into a corner, Ramiro confessed that the company once ordered to sink the Prometheus into the sea. There must be something terrifying there. Now that these strange events were happening one after another, it might be related to the only surviving boy from the Prometheus. The crowd thought it made sense and grabbed their weapons and headed towards the boy. In the corridor, they happened to meet Mora, who had just returned from outside. Everyone knew that the boy was in her room. Therefore, they forced Mora at gunpoint to take out her key. After opening the door, they searched everywhere but couldn't find the boy. Reluctantly, they had to leave the room and locked Mora inside. Mora was also puzzled. The boy was definitely in the room. Where could he have gone? Suddenly, there was a slight noise from under the bed. Mora moved the bed and was surprised to see a familiar triangular symbol. Unexpectedly, there was a secret passage here too. She lifted the wooden board, and sure enough, the boy was hiding inside. However, Mora was wondering why there was a triangular symbol and a secret compartment in her room, but the boy still didn't say a word. Mora had no choice but to leave and meet up with the captain. As Mora tried to unlock the door but couldn't, the boy took out a colorful beetle from his pocket. When it crawled through the door crack, the door actually opened automatically. Mora was once again surprised, but the boy didn't plan on explaining. Instead, he held her hand and following the beetle's guidance, they carefully walked down the corridor. For some reason, the boy was always able to avoid the guards in advance. On the other side, after Jerome and Oleg finished disposing of the bodies on the deck, they managed to create a false appearance of jumping into the sea while the guards weren't paying attention. This allowed Jerome to escape successfully. Faced with relentless pursuit from the guards, Jerome desperately knocked on doors, and to his surprise, someone actually opened their door and provided cover, helping him evade the guards. Concerned for the captain's safety, Jerome decided to take a risk and rescue him. The woman hesitated for a moment but decided to go with Jerome. Meanwhile, Oleg, who hadn't managed to escape, was again pushed back into the dark room by Franz, only to find it empty. It turned out that the captain and the priest had already escaped through the ventilation ducts. Just as they were preparing to forcefully remove their handcuffs, they happened upon Jerome who had come to rescue the captain. Unbeknownst to them, the Prometheus had already disappeared. They planned to use the lifeboat to send a distress signal there. As they were preparing to go into the sea, they ran into Mora and the little boy. Before they had time for pleasantries, Franz and his men arrived. The captain and his group had no choice but to surrender. That night, the lower deck passengers, scared witless by the mysterious death events, decided to push the little boy into the sea to eliminate future troubles. The captain and Jerome disagreed, rushing into the crowd to stop them. But they were few and powerless. In the end, they could only watch helplessly as the little boy was pushed into the sea. Mora was dazed, but she couldn't remember what kind of bond she had with the little boy. Afterward, the captain and the passengers gathered together in the banquet hall. Suddenly, there was a noise from the cupboard. This scene seemed all too familiar to Mora. Under everyone's gaze, the cupboard door was pushed open, and shockingly, the boy who had fallen into the sea walked out from inside. Everyone was in disbelief, and the banquet hall fell into a deathly silence. Once they had regained their composure, they decided to lock the little boy back in the cupboard. Only Mora felt this was wrong, but this time even the captain stepped in to stop her, arguing that the boy was too strange. But Mora stepped forward without regard for the guns pointed at her. The mysterious man from the Prometheus, sensing trouble, rushed forward to protect Mora. 
However, the room suddenly froze, as if someone had pressed the pause button, with only Mora unaffected. She was astonished as she plucked a bullet suspended in midair, her hands trembling. It took a long while for her to realize that the little boy was still in the cupboard. She thought that all of this was his doing, but the boy refused to explain, hurriedly pulling Mora out of the banquet hall. Not long after, the freeze ended, but from their perspective, Mora and the little boy had mysteriously disappeared. The group panicked when suddenly, the ship's alarm sounded. Everyone looked around in confusion, wondering what strange events would occur next on this terrifying ship. The captain was near hysterics. He was certain that Mora was hiding a huge secret, and the mysterious man who had just stepped forward was surely connected to her. The other passengers quickly intervened, arguing that the urgent task was to get to shore and leave the ship. However, the captain looked helpless. Franz had seized control of the ship the previous day and had ordered full speed ahead, which would rapidly consume a large amount of fuel. They estimated that the ship would run out of fuel before it could dock. The crowd decided to band together to regain control of the ship. Just then, the piercing alarm abruptly ceased, replaced by a ticking sound like a clock. Everyone stood dumbfounded, exchanging puzzled glances. They had never heard such a sound before. Soon, some passengers began to look dazed and collectively moved in a specific direction. Not only them, but even the passengers in their rooms began to slowly walk out. Those few unaffected were left standing in shock. Franz tried to stop them, but to no avail. This group proceeded at a steady pace. Before long, they arrived on the deck and, without hesitation, climbed over the railing and jumped into the sea. More and more followed, one after another. Those who remained lucid tried desperately to prevent them, but it was of no use. The bewitched passengers seemed to be answering the call of death, fearlessly leaping into the sea. The few survivors knew they would eventually fall under the same spell, so they hurried back to their rooms and tied themselves up with ropes. This proved effective. Even if someone lost consciousness and wanted to jump into the sea, they did not intend to untie the ropes, they just mechanically moved towards the deck. On the other hand, Deputy Ramiro did not show surprise. He seemed to have anticipated this, quickly typing a code into a control box, as if sending a message to someone. Then, he went to the control room, where he found the helmsman trembling in a corner. When the helmsman saw Ramiro, he immediately handed him a note. This was the reply he had received when he used a telegraph to report the situation to the company as passengers jumped into the sea. Ramiro looked at the words, Sink Ship, displayed on the telegraph, pulling out a keyboard identical to that of the mysterious man from his pocket. With a light press, the helmsman immediately collapsed to the ground. It seemed that Ramiro was indeed one of the masterminds behind this series of strange events. Elsewhere in the corridor, Mora also noticed something amiss. She forcefully stopped the little boy and asked him what was going on, but to no avail. Instead, he took her back to the room and wrote a note to tell her that they were listening. The cryptic words left Mora even more puzzled. The little boy had no choice but to whisper in her ear, saying that he couldn't tell her. The boy then pushed the wooden bed in the room aside to reveal a hidden passage. Mora watched curiously as the boy crawled into it, then pulled out a colorful beetle. The sealed passage suddenly opened a path. Driven by curiosity, Mora followed him through it, finding herself unexpectedly in a wilderness. At this point, she was too surprised to wonder why she was no longer at sea. She recognized this place, having seen it countless times in her dreams. Especially when she saw the solitary building in the distance, Mora didn't hesitate and ran towards it. Before long, the mysterious man on the ship seemed to sense Mora's disappearance. He quickly went to her room and, upon seeing the open secret passage, he also crawled in. He then pulled out a strange little keyboard, and after a few taps, the exit of the secret passage opened again. Soon, he arrived at the strange wilderness and saw the little boy not far away. He ran over to ask the boy. From the conversation, it was clear that they knew each other before, as if they were hiding from someone's pursuit. The mysterious man expressed his intention to stop everything before the other party sank the ship, instructing the little boy to stay put and not get discovered. It seems they are in opposition to Ramiro and likewise know the truth about the ship. The mysterious man quickly returned to the ship's cabin, where there was a steam monitor that was actually the ship's controller. As he was about to carry out some operations, a coal worker who was not bewitched suddenly appeared. The situation was critical, and the mysterious man didn't have time to explain, instead advising the coal worker to leave quickly. But the more the latter thought about it, the more something felt off, so he picked up a shovel and violently struck down. He believed that it was the mysterious man who brought misfortune to the ship. 
The mysterious man, in a fit of anger, took out the strange keyboard and lightly pressed it, causing the coal worker to collapse to the ground, his demise identical to that of the helmsman earlier. Meanwhile, in the wilderness, Mora finally reached the towering building. Unexpectedly, it turned out to be a mental hospital. Mora ascended the steps. The entire building was deserted, but she seemed familiar with the place, going straight to room 1011. There was a conspicuous restraint chair inside. As it turned out, she had experienced all of this in her dreams. Suddenly, an old man appeared behind her, who turned out to be Mora's biological father. Mora asked where her brother was, as she had uncovered her father's control over the ship. Before he could answer, two burly men suddenly appeared and forced her onto the restraint chair, then pulled out a syringe and injected Mora with something. When she woke up again, she found herself back on the ship. Looking at the marks on her hands, she knew that what she had just experienced was not a dream, so she quickly started moving. In the hallway, she happened to run into the captain who was coming to find her. She explained her findings to him. It's revealed that the time stopped in the hall previously was due to the power of the little boy's pyramid toy. And the countless dreams she had had were likely real events, just that her father had used some means to erase her memory. When Mora mentioned her father's name, the captain immediately realized that her father was the owner of the company that bought these ships. Mora said her father had spent his life studying human behavior, fascinated by exploring the brain, but he never showed interest in ships. She suspected that her father was using the passengers for some sort of research experiment. As they were talking, a colorful beetle suddenly appeared. Mora quickly caught it and crawled into the secret passage. She placed it on the ground, replicating the little boy's action, and a passage opened once again. However, this this time, the endpoint was not the wilderness. The captain following her quickly recognized it. It was his home. The captain felt that it was impossible for such a large building to fit inside a ship. Afterward, both of them, still puzzled, returned to the captain's cabin on the ship. Even if all these setups were Mora's father's arrangements, how could all the strange occurrences be explained? Mora seemed tense and felt that she had once touched the truth, but had lost that piece of memory. Seeing her honesty, the captain decided not to hide anymore. Shaking, he took out the passenger list found on the Prometheus. Not only was Mora's name on it, but the signature at the end was actually the captain's own. He was likely the captain of the Prometheus. Just as the two were shocked, the mysterious man in the cabin, after some operations, surprisingly cut off the circuits of the entire ship. The strange noises abruptly stopped, and the passengers who had lost consciousness also recovered. All bound passengers wept with joy, relieved that they had escaped disaster. Everyone subsequently gathered on the deck. Unexpectedly, out of more than 1,400 passengers, only a handful remained. At this moment, Ramiro took out a telegram sent by the company. The words, sink ship, written on it, confused everyone because the Prometheus was nowhere to be seen. However, the mysterious man explained that the company's intention was to sink the ship they were currently on. The scene then switched to Mora's father in a study somewhere. He received the telegram code sent by Ramiro and ordered his men to send instructions for Ramiro to locate the little boy as soon as possible. The blonde woman was on the verge of collapse, believing that all the misfortune was brought on by the little boy. Consequently, she harbored resentment toward Mora, who was relatively close to him. The captain pointed out that their priority was to restore power to the ship so they could make a landing and save themselves. The captain then instructed Franz and the coal worker Oleg to lead people to the engine room to burn coal. The remaining people were also assigned different tasks. However, as soon as everyone left the room, they saw a clump of black crystals growing in the corridor. Everyone was sure that these had just appeared. Someone couldn't resist the curiosity and wanted to touch it, but was immediately stopped by the mysterious man. Looking at the strange crystals that were still growing, everyone couldn't help feeling chills down their spines. They only thought of escaping from this broken ship as quickly as possible, so they ran toward the engine room and started shoveling coal. On the other hand, the remaining few women were searching the corridor for other survivors. They found more and more places growing black crystals. One of the older women couldn't resist and gently touched it. As a result, her fingers started to darken rapidly. Ramiro, accompanied by two priests, went to the control room to send a distress telegram. Deep down, he knew this was useless. He then left the room and went straight to the banquet hall. Unbelievably, there was a secret passage hidden in the cupboard. After the little boy fell into the sea, he came out from here. Ramiro found his boss through this secret passage. He reported that the situation was somewhat out of control. However, Mora's father was only concerned about the whereabouts of the little boy, as the pyramid in his hand was of utmost importance. 
On the other side, the captain and Mora were frantically searching for the missing little boy. The key to all the mysteries certainly lay with him. The two followed the secret passage, returning again to Mora's memory space. She vaguely remembered that the mental asylum was built by her father, and it might hold some clues. They then returned to room 1011. Mora mentioned that this was where she was held when she was considered mentally ill. However, there was no one inside at the moment. The captain went straight to the window and discovered it was sealed with metal plates, just like the outer panels of the ship. Mora, refusing to believe it, pried open the fireplace seal, only to find the same situation. It was clear that the building didn't exist in reality, and was likely still part of the ship's structure. The two then searched the entire building, but didn't find any other abnormalities. However, when they returned to the corridor of room 1011, they discovered it was covered in black crystals. Mora couldn't resist and wanted to touch one, but she was stopped by the sudden appearance of the mysterious man. This was great for the captain, who was worried about not finding any clues. Both of them suspected the man of working for Mora's father. Yet the mysterious man appeared anxious, saying that there was not much time left. He pleaded with Mora to recover her memory as quickly as possible. The captain tried to threaten the mysterious man with his gun, but the man suddenly disarmed the captain, took out a control keyboard, and pressed it hard, causing the captain to disappear and appear near his own house. Mora picked up the gun and asked the mysterious man who he really was. He finally revealed that his name was Daniel, and he claimed to be Mora's husband. They had been married for 12 years. This was like a bolt from the blue. Mora couldn't accept it for a moment. She thought Daniel was her father's lackey, so she took away his control keyboard and locked him in the room. Mora was on the verge of collapse. She just couldn't understand why her father would oppose her. In her anger, she threw away the gun, which caused a crack to appear in the distant air. Mora was stunned. It turned out that the distant scenery was all virtual. In reality, it was only a limited space constructed of glass. On the other side, the passengers in the engine room had managed to reignite the engines after an hour of hard struggle, restoring power to the cruise ship. However, the priests in the control room were flabbergasted. Ramiro had not returned since he left, and they had no idea how to handle this massive machine. The older priest attempted to learn the basics from the instruction manual, only to be horrified to find that every book on the shelf repeated the same sentence. May your coffee kick in before reality does. The two priests looked at each other, clueless about what this sentence meant. Meanwhile, the women had searched around but found no other survivors. When they gathered on the deck, they were surprised to see a massive storm approaching in the distance, the likes of which had never been seen before. The captain, who had been thrown into the memory space, returned to the ship via the fireplace passage, only to find himself on the long-lost Prometheus, and surrounding him were many abandoned ships of various sizes on the sea. Mora, upon returning from her memory space, was back on the original ship. As she watched the intensifying storm outside, she thought of Daniel's previous warning that there wasn't much time left, possibly referring to this upcoming storm. The survivors in the cockpit were now panicking. With the captain and his deputy Ramiro nowhere to be found, this ship would inevitably be swallowed by the storm without anyone at the helm. So they split up and ran off in search of someone who could steer the ship. Only the old madam stood pale-faced in place. Earlier, she had succumbed to curiosity and touched one of the crystals. Now her entire palm had turned black. She soon ran into Mora, who was looking for the captain. The old madam kept asking what was going on, but Mora was just as confused. All she could do was comfort the old madam, assuring her that this would pass. Mora then left the cockpit. Worried about the captain's safety, she knew she had to reunite with him as soon as possible. Plus, she needed his help to solve the mystery. But when Mora entered the captain's memory space via the secret passage, she found no trace of him. Since she couldn't find the captain, Mora decided to explore Daniel's memory space in hopes of finding new clues. Upon arriving at Daniel's room, she found a photo of herself at the entrance to the secret passage. An uneasy premonition welled up inside her, and she quickened her pace. In no time, she arrived at Daniel's memory space, which consisted of a single private bedroom. The familiar decor made Mora feel oddly at home. She then found a pile of scattered photos on the bedside table, all of them showing her with Daniel and the little boy, indicating that this might be a picture of a happy family of three. Mora began to regret her decision to lock Daniel in the mental hospital, but Daniel was not sitting idle. He looked around the room and pulled out a steel pipe, prying open the protective panel behind the window. 
A mess of wires was revealed inside, and the space, though not large, was just enough for a person to pass through. Daniel groped his way in the darkness, finally finding a round iron door. Upon opening it, he found himself in an open area with a dry well. Apparently, this was the priest's memory space. As expected, everyone's memory spaces were interconnected in this space. Not daring to linger, Daniel returned to the ship's passage. He opened another door, this time to a snowy landscape. A long trail of blood led to a cabin. Daniel recognized this as the memory space of the coal worker, Olek. He seemed to know the exits of each place, searching the virtual wall and quickly found a hidden door. He continued his exploration, this time finally reaching Mora's memory space. He walked straight to the wooden cross, lifting the cover of the tomb. There was another hidden space inside, and unexpectedly, the little boy had been hiding there. The boy asked right away if he had found the key. Daniel shook his head, saying only Mora knew where the key was, but her memory had not yet recovered. He then assured his son that he had thought of another way, a way to save her mother without needing the key. Before he left, the boy gave him a ring, saying it was his mother Mora's wedding ring. But at this time, Ramiro was searching for the boy all over the ship. He rushed into a private office, pulling out a deeply hidden tablet from a cabinet. This was the core controller of the cruise ship, several levels higher than the strange keyboard. It could monitor the real-time situation of the entire ship. In no time, he found the boy's hiding place. Meanwhile, Daniel returned to the ship. Upon opening his room's door, he found that the secret passage had been opened, so he immediately crawled in. Sure enough, in his memory space, he saw Mora still in a daze. He then told her the truth about everything. It turned out that everything on the ship was a data simulation. Mora was trapped in this recurring loop. Daniel and his son had gone through great lengths to infiltrate this cruise ship from the Prometheus, all in search for the key that Mora had forgotten. Only in this way could they use the pyramid to shut down the entire simulation program and save Mora from the infinite loop. Although Mora had not recovered her memory, she remembered her pendant, inside which was a delicate key. This was sent to her by her brother in a letter. Daniel excitedly reminded Mora to keep it safe, as it was the key for everyone to escape. But unbeknownst to them, their every move was being watched by Mora's father through the surveillance cameras. This old man would occasionally glance at the timer on the table, which read, 21 minutes until shutdown. In the midst of a tempest, the cruise ship was adrift on the waves. If all goes as expected, this ship will face a catastrophic disaster in 21 minutes. Everything will then reset and Mora will commence a new cycle. Even though the ship weighed 10,000 tons, it was nothing but a lone boat bobbing up and down in the face of nature's fury. The passengers on the ship were pale with fear as the captain had disappeared and no one could be found to take the helm. The security chief, Franz, had no choice but to take charge. He instructed Oleg to take over the helm, reminding him to ensure that the bow of the ship faced the direction of the waves to prevent it from capsizing. Franz himself went to close the ship's bulkheads, otherwise seawater would pour in. Before long, Oleg reached the control room. Fortunately, the ship was so heavy that, despite the effort required to steer, they could just about avoid capsizing as long as the direction was adjusted properly. Just as Oleg breathed a sigh of relief, the girl next to him suddenly heard her deceased mother's call. She rushed excitedly onto the deck and indeed saw her mother waving at her. Oleg, abandoning the wheel, yelled at the girl who then realized that what she had seen was just an illusion. In a panic, Oleg braved the storm to bring her back, but in the next moment a huge wave rolled in and Olek was swept into the sea. Now the only helmsman on board was gone. The ship began to veer uncontrollably, tilting under the impact of the monstrous waves. The steel frame storing coal in the engine room suddenly collapsed, crushing a coal shoveling worker. The ship was in even greater danger without power, as a large amount of seawater poured into the hull. Franz realized the dire situation and knew that he must close all the hatch doors quickly before the entire ship would be filled with seawater. When it came time to close the last hatch door, he found that the handle on the inside had fallen off. Franz pushed the blonde woman into the cabin and went outside the hatch door himself. Only by pushing the door from the outside could he completely close the hatch. The blonde woman's mother, after losing her son, had already given up the idea of escaping. The old priest, unable to convince her, decided to stay with her to face the death that was about to come. Soon, the seawater that poured in gradually filled the cabin, and the two quickly met their end. Franz met a similar fate. It was his self-sacrifice in closing the hatch door that spared the people in the inner cabin. However, this was only a temporary solution. 
In truth, everything on this ship was just a simulation program, and there were only 21 minutes left until the cycle restarted. At that point, the other passengers would die from various accidents as usual. Fortunately, Mora saw through everything and obtained the key to the decoding program. Now, all she had to do was insert it into the pyramid of her son, and this infinite simulation loop would be eliminated. Her husband Daniel was extremely excited. He brought Mora to his independent office and took out a supercontroller hidden in the cabinet. The display showed that there were only 11 minutes left until the restart. Because each cycle was an eight-day period, Mora's memory would be wiped clean after the simulation restarted. They actually tried to escape from the loop many times before, but all failed, and this time was the closest they had ever come to success. For safety's sake, Daniel had to save the current progress for future reference. Finally, the couple planned to go to Mora's memory space to get their son's pyramid. However, as soon as they entered the room, they found that the secret passage had been sealed off. It turns out that Ramiro had found the little boy's hiding place through the supercontroller and brought him to Mora's father. Seeing Mora about to face another cycle restart, a mocking laugh suddenly rang out in the room. Mora's father praised Daniel, saying his method of using the Prometheus to regain access to the simulation program was very clever, but it was a pity that it would also end in failure. A new round of simulation was about to start. The old man then forced Mora to hand over the key, promising to ensure her son's safety in return. But Daniel was resolute and said he had a way to change the ending. Before leaving, he secretly gave Mora something. It was the ring that their son had given him. Soon after, the mechanical countdown began. As the countdown ended with one, the survivors on the cruise ship witnessed a horrific disaster that seemed to come straight from hell. A giant vortex suddenly appeared on the sea surface, and the out-of-control cruise ship headed straight for the center of the vortex. To the survivors on the ship, it was like a moon in the sky, representing either the hope of rebirth or the abyss of eternal darkness. On the other side, the captain, trapped on the Prometheus, woke up and immediately went on deck. He suddenly saw a vortex appear in the sea nearby, and a cruise ship sailed out of it. Looking across, he saw the survivors on the other ship's deck, including Mora and her party. Mora also spotted the captain standing on the deck. Their eyes met, both filled with shock. It seemed that after each simulation round, abandoned cruise ships would gather here. Unable to suppress his confusion, the captain swam over to Mora's ship. She revealed to them everything she knew. However, everyone present found it hard to accept the idea of the simulation program. Seeing their disbelief, Mora asked if they remembered how they boarded this ship. They were all shocked to hear that, evidently, they had completely forgotten. It seemed like they were supposed to be on the ship all along. Mora then pulled out a letter. It turned out that not only her, but everyone had received a similar letter. The contents roughly linked their tragic pasts to the Prometheus. This was probably a lead-in prepared by Daniel for boarding the ship. Mora had already made up her mind. The only plan now was to find her evil father and find a way out from him. But the people present had mostly suffered the pain of losing their loved ones. They were not willing to trust the daughter of the evil man behind all this. They decided to leave the cruise ship in lifeboats. Mora was somewhat speechless. That sea area might be fake and they wouldn't be able to escape that way. But they decided to try anyway. Only the captain chose to stay with Mora, as they had been teammates from the beginning and knew the most information. The two decided to return to Mora's memory space through the secret passage. Unfortunately, Ramiro had tampered with it, causing the passage to disappear. After some thought, Mora took the captain into Daniel's room. They successfully reached his memory space via a secret passage. Mora had learned from her husband that all memory spaces were interconnected. So she tentatively pried open a panel, peeled off the ship's metal skin, and sure enough, they saw a passage filled with wiring. The two glanced at each other and then stepped in without hesitation. Their experience was similar to Daniel's before. After passing through several different memory spaces, they finally arrived at Mora's own memory space. After separating from Mora, Daniel found himself alone, making his way to the control center of the cruise ship. He pulled out a keyboard and began to haphazardly type. To his surprise, the control box extended an even more intricate device, which he presumed was the real core of the simulation program. After connecting it to the keyboard, Daniel started his operation. Meanwhile, the program inside the ship began its final cleanup. The surviving group intended to leave via the lifeboats, but quickly, growing black crystals filled the corridors. 
Faced with these deadly objects, the group found themselves in a desperate situation. Luckily, a previously sealed wall of the cabin opened a pathway to their memory spaces. Without a second thought, they rushed in. The surrounding scenery instantly shifted, a lifeline Daniel created by hacking the main program. In these memory spaces, they were safe from the black crystals. Before long, the group, scattered across different memory spaces, managed to find exits, eventually returning to the ship's cabin. By now, the black crystals had vanished since Daniel had completed the modifications to the main program. He then crawled into the secret passage of the banquet hall. Mora's father, who had observed everything through surveillance, got furious by that. He then brought the little boy to the study. He claimed that he wasn't the mastermind behind everything, but rather one of the victims trapped here. He said the true creator of the simulation program was Mora herself, and only she could rescue everyone. Seeing the boy's disbelief, Mora's father decided to restore the boy's repressed memories. The two then went to room 1011 in the mental hospital. The old man made the boy sit on a restraining chair and injected him with a white liquid capable of restoring memory. The boy's vision blurred, and he saw a scene from many years ago. It turned out that the boy had been diagnosed with a terminal illness. To save her son, his mother, Mora, had given the boy an injection of a black liquid that caused memory loss and then created this endlessly cycling simulation space. This way, the boy could live forever. The only way to break the simulation was to use the key Mora left for herself. The old man then instructed Ramiro to retrieve the key from Mora. The obedient Ramiro stepped out of the office and ran into Mora and her companion. Once again, Ramiro used the boy's safety as a threat, forcing Mora to hand over the key. Seeing his mission accomplished, Ramiro pressed the remote controls button to permanently disconnect the interfering captain. Following this, Mora was brought to her father's room. The father and daughter, long estranged, finally faced each other. Seeing her son's eyes filled with disappointment, Mora thought her father had manipulated his memories. However, the old man didn't want to explain much. Instead, he instructed his men to bind Mora to a restraining chair, berating her for creating this cyclical space out of her selfish desires, making everyone suffer along with her. Now, Mora's father was about to leave, but he intended to trap his daughter here forever. He then called the boy over to bring out the memory-erasing potion and, without hesitation, injected it into Mora. Once he had settled this matter, Mora's father took out the key he had just received and inserted it into the pyramid slot. This was the only way to clear the simulation space. To his surprise, the environment did not change even after a long while. It was then he realized that Daniel had modified the main program. By this time, the ship's hull began to shatter, emitting a hot red glow. All the survivors stood there, staring blankly at everything in front of them, as though waiting for a judgment of fate. As the red fragments increased, the entire ship began to disintegrate. It did not take long for it to revert to virtual data. Meanwhile, Mora opened her eyes to find herself in a memory space. She followed the light above the tomb to a hidden room where Daniel reappeared. He excitedly told Mora that he had finally succeeded. The simulation did not restart, and Mora's memory had not disappeared. It was Daniel's hacking skills that managed to transform the original simulation space into its current form. Actually, this was the simulation space they initially created for their son. Mora's father's pyramid had lost its function, and the toy triangle in his hand had become the key to destroying the simulation. Daniel told his wife that when Mora first created the simulation space, her brother took over and controlled everything. They had to leave before her brother discovered them. The key Mora left behind was actually the wedding ring she wore. The scene then shifted, and Mora woke up from her unconscious state again. This time, she was in a closed metal space with several companions who were still asleep like pigs. By their appearance, they were all survivors of the ship. Curiously, Mora looked out the window and found herself inside a spaceship. She had no idea how long they had been traveling in the vast universe. Soon, a message from her brother appeared on the display of the control tower. Welcome back to reality. This might indicate that Mora was still trapped in the loop of another simulation program. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.